The lecture you are about to see is part of our annual Allen Edwards Psychology Lecture Series. Professor Edwards was affiliated with the Department of Psychology for half a century until his death in 1994. He was an outstanding teacher, researcher, and writer who introduced new statistical techniques that are credited with changing the way modern psychological research is conducted. Allen also permanently enhanced the intellectual climate at UW Psychology by endowing the Allen Edwards Lectureship, which since 1999 has brought in an impressive list of renowned psychologists to the UW campus to interact with faculty and students. The lecture you're about to watch is one of a pair given back to back that matched a UW Psychology professor with a visiting researcher to talk about a topic of great public and scientific interest. Good evening, I'm Scott Murray, the Associate Chair for Research of the Department of Psychology, and I have the honor of welcoming you to the fifth annual Edwards Public Lecture Series. I'm pleased that you could join us as we celebrate one of our department's research specialties, the development of behavior. Our psychology department seeks to take advantage of its unique collection of world-renowned researchers by facilitating interactions between traditional subdisciplines sub within psychology, for example, clinical, developmental, cognitive, behavioral neuroscience, social and animal behavior. We aim to foster new collaborations that lead to solutions to large-scale societal problems. This year's focus on the development of behavior exemplifies our department's interdisciplinary research programs that use the tools of behavioral assessment, neuroscience, ethology, and developmental theories to advance our understanding of how the human mind develops from infancy to adulthood. Such a comprehensive understanding is essential for the development of effective educational tools and therapeutic interventions for our children. First up this evening is Professor Michael Beecher of the Psychology Department at the University of Washington. Professor Beecher entered the department in 1978 and served as chair from 1993 to 2002. He's also an adjunct professor in, of biology, a member of the graduate program in neurobiology and behavior, and affiliate of the Bledel Hearing Research Center at the UW. Dr. Beecher received his BA from Reed College, his PhD at Boston University, and did postdoctoral training in primatology at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Beecher's research specialty is animal behavior. After dabbling with uh, primates, bats, and even the most difficult animal species of all to deal with, homo sapiens, Dr. Beecher switched to birds and has never looked back. <laughs> Dr. Beecher is a fellow of the Animal Behavior Society, a recipient of that society's Exemplar Research Award and the Distinguished uh, Service Award. He's also past president of the Animal Behavior Society, and past editor of the journal Animal, Animal Behavior. He spent 2006 and 2007 at the National Science Foundation where he was program director for Animal Behavior in the Biology Directorate. Please welcome Professor Michael Beecher. Thank you, Scott. And uh, thank you all very much for coming. I'm gonna be telling you about song learning and songbirds. Uh, they are a, uh, fascinating model system, and uh, the interest in them uh, really uh, comes from the fact that they're one of the few animals that do learn their, uh, learn their vocalizations. Very few animals do. As far as we know, all the songbirds, all 4,000 species do, and a few other animal groups, uh, including parrots uh, and uh, hummingbirds among the birds, and that's it. Um, the cetaceans, the whales and dolphins do also, and um, also some bats we now think do, and, uh, and among primates, only uh, the humans, that's the interesting thing. Uh, this, uh, their, um, their status as a, mo as a model system is not simply due to the fact that they have vocal learning and are like humans in this regard, but the fact that we know so much about the neurobiology. I'm not going to be talking about the neurobiology tonight, but I do want to uh, point out that this is really uh, a pioneer model system in the neurobiology of learning and is uh, still uh, the premier system um, for the study of learning. It is, in fact, and this should be of interest to all of us here, it was the first vertebrate in which we had really unambiguous evidence of growth of new neurons in adulthood. So there's always hope for all of us. <laughs> Uh, the song control uh, system is actually the major model system for the study of learning in general, not just simply vocal learning, 
but just uh, plasticity in the brain and how it functions in, in learning. Uh, and just to give you a feel of, uh, of how people feel about this, this is a quote from Fernando Nautabom, who is the eminent uh, and really the pioneer in this area. Uh, it may well be that our best understanding of how complex skills are acquired and how broken circuits can be fixed will come not from humans, uh, not from primates, uh, but from the way birds learn their song. So uh, a huge interest in, the, in this system. Uh, I'm going to be talking about behavior. Uh, and the study of uh, song learning uh, at the behavioral level really pretty much uh, begins with this guy, uh, Peter Marler. Uh, and he really sort of um, did everything. He sort of, uh, to begin with, he set the, uh, established the standard methodology for studying bird song learning. And he discovered what uh, are basically considered the foundation facts for what we know about uh, bird song learning. And if you take any introductory course where this, uh, this comes up, uh, you always basically get the stuff that, that Peter discovered. Uh, and he was also the first person to point out the parallels uh, between birdsong learning uh, and human language learning. Uh, and I'm going to go through those things, those three points in order, uh, because they're all important. Um, first off, the methodology is often referred to as uh, the a tape tutor method. And uh, when I toss this slide up uh, in my undergraduate courses, people look at this and say, what? <laughs> That's a tape recorder, um, an old-fashioned tape recorder. Um, uh, but basically, here's how it goes. Uh, the, uh, you go out in the field, you get uh, baby birds out of the nest, you bring them in, and they're a couple days old, uh, their eyes are closed, they're essentially deaf, uh, and uh, you basically, uh, uh, you, you're, you're beginning uh, fresh with them, and they have not, in particular, heard anything in the field. You uh, hand feed them, uh, it's a very excruciating uh, business, uh, and uh, when they become independent, uh, or, or, or shortly before that, you put them into an isolation chamber, and in the chamber uh, there is a loudspeaker, and from the loudspeaker uh, they hear songs. And that's how they will, uh, in fact, uh, be tutored uh, by, this, uh, by this tape recorder. Nowadays, uh, we use a computer instead of a tape recorder, but basically, same idea. Now, the interesting thing here, or the, or the point of all this, is, is that, in fact, you get ultimate and complete experimental control when you do it this way. Uh, and uh, talking about model systems, you realize that, well, clearly, this is something we could not do with humans, would not, could not do with humans. And some of you may have heard of uh, the famous story of Caspar Hauser, uh, one of the people, that, uh, one of these unfortunate individuals that was shut off in a room uh, and fed once a day and never talked to. Uh, and uh, among other things, he had serious language problems. Um, um, now, when you do this kind of experiment with uh, birds, particularly if you totally isolate them from, from song is referred to as a Casper Hauser experiment, but in the experiments we're going to talk about, that's just one uh, condition that people do to, to, to see what happens. Mostly, you use, do this method to see what you can teach them and what you can't teach them. Now, here are the basic results. First off is that there's a sense to period for song learning. Uh, and this particular species I'm showing you here is the white-crowned sparrow. And it's the, uh, the species that Peter did all his, uh, most of his early work with. Um, they have a sensitive period that's very short. It's uh, from about day 10 to about day 50. Uh, and what that really means is that if they hear White Crown Sparrow song in that period, they will learn it, and they will learn the particular dialect you play them. Uh, however, if you hold off until day 51 and then start uh, tutoring them, they'll never learn it, and they will ultimately sing garbage, uh, uh, abnormal song. Um, now, secondly, there seems to be uh, what Peter called an innate template uh, for species song. And uh, uh, the way in which he discovered that was to say, well, what happens if instead of giving them white crowned sparrow song in the sense to period, I give them some other kind of song, maybe a similar song like song sparrow song? Well, the answer is they won't learn it. Uh, or if you give them a choice between white crowned sparrow and anything else, they will learn white crowned sparrow. But if you give them just 
non-species song, they will not learn it and they will ultimately sing abnormal song. Uh, so they reject it. They somehow know what's their species song and what's not. Uh, they do, in fact, imitate what they hear within limits. Uh, it's got to be pretty good white crown sparrow song, but they'll learn all sorts of different dialects of that song. So they do know what it is, but they need to hear it, and they'll copy essentially what they hear. Uh, memorization precedes uh, production. Uh, that's just, in the case of the white crown sparrow, it's quite marked. Uh, the bird uh, basically takes it all in from day 10 to 50, and then some at a later point actually starts to sing and eventually will arrive at a good copy of what uh, he heard earlier. And there, as I just said, there's specialized brain mechanisms. We've already talked about that. Now, what are the parallels with humans? Well, you see the parallels with humans. They're essentially all of these things. There's a sense to period in humans for language learning. and It pretty much uh, is, uh, goes up to uh, puberty. Uh, it varies a little bit from individual to individual, but clearly uh, we have a much harder time learning uh, a second language as an adult than if we'd learned it uh, earlier. Um, there are uh, innate uh, perceptual mechanisms, or uh, uh, as Noam Chomsky uh, called them, he talked about a universal grammar. Uh, he talked about the idea that we have this, appear to have humans, all humans have this innate knowledge of the basic grammatical structure that's common to all languages. Um, he called this a universal grammar. It's a different sort of innate mechanism, needless to say, but we're talking about parallels, and this is another uh, very good parallel. Memorization precedes uh, uh, imitation I left out. We have not simply dialects, but we have different languages. Uh, uh, memorization precedes production. If you watch uh, young uh, kids growing up, what they understand is always ahead of what, in fact, they can produce. Uh, and needless to say, there are specialized brain mechanisms uh, that if you have a, a stroke, for example, in, in Wernicke's area, you'll have problems with language. You won't have other kinds of problems. Uh, this has been known for a long time. Now, now it gets interesting, and we're getting to what this talk is really going to be about, and that is this classic story does leave out one thing, and that's social context. Uh, Peter Marler basically said to control everything, I'm just going to isolate the bird. No, I don't, want, I don't want to use live birds as tutors because I can't control what they're going to sing and when they're going to sing and so forth. Uh, so he simply got rid of the social context. And Luis Baptista says, well, what actually happens if, in fact, you put the context back in? And so what he did was simply replace the tape tutor with a live singing bird in various ways. And when you do that, you see a bunch of things change. So the sensitive period is longer. And just to give you a nice example of, of one of the ways in which Luis did this, if you give the bird a tape tutor uh, of one dialect from day 10 to 50, that's the sensitive period, and then you bring in another bird, uh, you, excuse me, you bring in a live bird, who is singing a different dialect, guess what the bird learns? He learns the song from that live bird, even though, in fact, he doesn't hear that until day 51. Uh, so the sensitive period is longer when you do it this way. Uh, there's a second difference, and that is that, in fact, he will, in fact, uh, learn the song of a non-species. And so one of the examples that uh, Luis used was a strawberry finch. It was a totally different kind of bird, looks totally different, sounds completely different. Uh, song sparrows can, in fact, copy this. Now, one of the interesting points about this is it does suggest, in fact, this innate template idea is not bad because what this shows you is the bird, when he simply hears it over a loudspeaker, would not copy this finch song, but, in fact, if there's a live bird singing at him, he can do it, so he is capable of doing it. He just doesn't do it under uh, tape tutor conditions. So what this basically says is that social factors are important, and what it means is that we have to add this to our list of parallels uh, with human language learning. Okay, now, uh, if we take these, uh, these little studies I've just sketched out and, and think about them, uh, what you realize is that they give you various ideas about how the song learning process might work. And I'm going to just mention three uh, models of how it might work. The first one is suggested by the tape tutor design, and that is simply what I'm going to call simple eavesdropping. 
And that is the bird simply cocks his ear at the base of the tree and listens to the guy up there singing and says, okay, that's good, I'll, I'll sing that. Pass my template, I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn that one, and that's, that's, that's gonna be my song. Doesn't need to see him, really, doesn't need to interact with him, just needs to hear it. Uh, then, if you think about the live tutor experiment, it says, well, all of a sudden, if you've in fact got a live bird with whom you can't interact, uh, then in fact, maybe that's what's really crucial to song learning, is you have to interact with your tutor, and I'm simply going to call this a direct uh, interaction uh, model. This is often assumed of these live tutor experiments, but in fact, in these live tutor experiments, you often have a tutor and several young birds. And so, in fact, the, the, you don't know, in fact, if the tutor is actually singing, interacting with a particular bird. Uh, and people, in fact, rarely looked at it. Uh, and then there's this third model. And this model, uh, I'm going to call the social e uh, eavesdropping model. And we actually got the idea for this model from lab experiments that we've done. I'm not going to actually talk about these lab experiments. I'm going to talk just about field experiments. But that's where this idea comes from. And the idea, in fact, is that the uh, young bird uh, simply is attuned to interactions between uh, adult, uh, typically adult, or at least two birds that are singing back and forth. And that, that process of uh, social interaction and vocal interaction is key to his learning those songs. And you can see there probably would be some real advantages to this uh, way of learning song. One of them would be is you would not simply learn songs, but you would learn how songs are used, which you can't really easily know if you're just interacting with, with one particular bird and you don't know the rules of the game. How do you exactly have a conversation with that other bird? So this, these uh, two models in particular I'm going to uh, contrast today, the direct interaction and the social eavesdropping. A little bit on our study species, just for background, really fast. Uh, the song sparrow, only male sing. This is typical of most uh, uh, north temperate zone species. Uh, basically, most North American birds are this way. Most European birds, uh, this is the case. Go down to the tropics, males and females both sing. They even sometimes duet. Very cool. No one really understands it. Um, but I'm just going to talk about this particular case here. Uh, they have not one song, they have multiple songs, uh, typically eight or nine, could be a little more, a little less. Uh, each one is very different. Uh, they learn their songs in the first year. The sense of period is somewhat longer than what we saw for the white crowned sparrow. We don't know the exact details. Summer is crucial, but they can continue for the rest of the year. They never change after the first year. And this point you'll see in a, in a moment is important, is that neighboring birds share song types. And I'll just say that that's because, in fact, they tend to learn from birds that will be their neighbors. And that's why neighbors wind up with very uh, similar song types. This is our uh, study site. Uh, some of you will recognize this as uh, Discovery Park in Seattle. Uh, in this park, it's a, a song sparrow heaven. Uh, we have about 150 uh, mated pairs that are, uh, that are territorial year round. They're there all year long. We color band them so we know who's who. We keep track of them. A uh, typical bird will last one to six years. Uh, because they uh, last as long as they do, uh, they have long-term neighbors. So a guy will typically have the same neighbors uh, from year to year. There'll be some turnover but at least some of them will be long-term. Very quickly on song function, this is true of just about all songbirds, uh, there are two main functions. One is to attract females uh, and to maybe stimulate them. No one really understands that too well. Uh, and the other is the male-male interaction process, and I'm going to talk about that in more detail. Uh, this is a song sparrow song. <laughs> And that's kind of fast, isn't it? Let's hear it. Half speed. Now I'm not going to do the bouncing ball thing here, but if you watch, you should be, you should be able to actually follow this. So it's just about three seconds long, but there's a lot of stuff going on, and I think you can, you can hear that. And when you realize that a given bird has a bunch of those songs, 
then you can begin to get the notion that he may actually have something to say. There's a lot going on in this song repertoire, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about what they use them for. Now here you see the songs of two neighbors, and I, you think you might be able to see most of this. Uh, the, there's one neighbor in the left column, one neighbor in the right column. I haven't shown all the songs, but you can see the songs. Uh, some of the songs are very similar. Those are extremely similar. Those are very similar. Those are very similar. Uh, we call those shared songs. Uh, and it could be that they're so similar because one of them learned from the other, or maybe they both learned from someone else. But, but there's something like that going on. It's related to learning, and we actually uh, have shown that, though I don't know this particular example. Uh, and these are unshared. And that's so you can look at these and, and you'll realize that they, they don't match up in any way. Uh, and these are unshared songs and the birds may have some more of these. This is a fairly typical pattern. They may share three or four of their songs. A little bit about context for singing. There's, a, uh, there's some solo singing that we aren't going to talk about too much that the male uses to attract a female. The female is usually away. He's trying to get a female, he sings a lot, eventually he gets a female, and then he doesn't sing so much anymore, okay? So that's, so that's, one, that's one circumstance. Uh, here's another one that's fairly similar. They post their territories. Uh, you know, they're not like mammals. Mammals will walk around their territories and pee in all the trees, and that works just great. Songbirds, instead of doing that, they sing. And they just pop up and sing and here, and then they go over there in the territory and they pop up and they sing. And they just kind of do this at some level all day long. And that's posting their territory, saying, this is mine, I'm still here. Uh, but in fact, again, much of the time he's doing it, there may be no one listening. Or the other bird that, that does hear it is out of sight, typically. Uh, so it's kind of to the unknown bird. Someone's out there, but it's not to anyone in particular. And then there's the interesting thing that I'm going to talk about mostly, and that's interactive singing. When two neighbors sing back and forth to each other, and I'm going to tell you about that. And that's interesting because that kind of singing is much more like communication as we know it. In some sense, in some very loose sense, the birds are having a conversation about something. Now, here's how they do it, okay? So I'm showing you again two neighbors. These are different ones than you saw before. Uh, and I'm showing you three shared songs at the top. I'm calling them A, B, and C. And then I'm showing you uh, a couple of unshared songs at the bottom. And let's assume they have a bunch more unshared, okay? So they have three shared and a bunch that are unshared. Now, here's the way it works. And we've done a bunch of experiments to find this out. If one neighbor wants to talk to the other one, He's going to come near the boundary. He's not going to sing any song. He's going to sing one of those shared songs. That's the rule. And then the other guy says, oh, you're talking to me? Uh, and then what he can do is a couple of things. If he just wants to say, I hear you, I know you are, fine. Then he'll sing one of these shared songs, but not the one the guy sang. If, in fact, uh, he is disturbed by this guy coming near the boundary and singing, maybe they're not, you know, there's some dispute over the boundary. Maybe the female has come, his female has come and laid her, uh, uh, made a nest right by the boundary and there's some sort of issue. Uh, under these circumstances, if he wants to uh, threaten the guy, what he's going to do is to sing the same song back to him. That's a threat. Uh, and finally, if he's busy, now, maybe he's feeding young. He just doesn't want to deal with this guy, but he does want to reply. He just, you know, but he wants to get out of there. Then, in fact, he'll sing one of the unshared songs, and he'll leave. So that's it. And that's a very simple version of it, but that, that's kind of how the system works. And um, the take-home message from that is this, and that is bird song is not human language. But it is a communication system, and it does have rules as to how you use songs. And so the young bird not only needs to learn songs, he needs to learn how to use them. And so this is kind of like human language in that sense. Now, it's different from human language in two important ways that I should make clear. And that is, in humans and in some songbirds, uh, vocal learning comes via friends and family. And it's a very nice experience. And here we see humans doing it, and here we see zebra finches doing it. 
Uh, Mike Goldstein is, uh, in the next uh, program, is going to be talking about uh, a little bit about how Zebra Finch uh, mothers and, and fathers uh, help shape the learning of their kids. Uh, but there's uh, another way it happens, and this is perhaps more common, and that is in many songbirds, your learning comes via your rivals, your future territorial neighbors. Uh, and so, in fact, that's a very different situation. There's a second way in which learning is very different, and that is humans learn all the words in their language, basically, right? We don't just say, I want to learn these words, the heck with those words. But that's not the way it works for songbirds. Songbirds uh, have a very selective, uh, most of them have a very selective form of song learning. So if this song sparrow were actually a white crowned sparrow, his problem would be something like this. He hears a couple of birds singing. They're singing essentially the same song. They may be a little different. And he says, OK, I'll learn that piece of cake. Uh, but that's actually not the way it works. Because these guys, these are song sparrows. Uh, and like most birds, and I should say about 70% of songbirds, 75% of songbirds have these song repertoires. So that's the more typical case. And to these circumstances, He's going to hear all these songs, and so what the heck's he going to do? And in fact, the problem is worse than this. Uh, much worse than two birds and 20 songs. It's a lot of birds, a lot of songs, <laughs> all over the place. So what's he going to do? Uh, and we've actually, as you will see, I'll mention this, we've gone out and actually measured this. But they hear hundreds of songs, and he's got to pick just eight or nine of those. How does he pick? those eight or nine. If you think about it for a while, you realize that that, if you could figure that out, you figured out the function of song learning. If he hears all the songs and just picks out these ones, if you can figure out why he does, you're in business. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do to keep this as short as I possibly can is to talk just about our field studies. They're more fun anyway, uh, though we've learned at least as much from the stuff we've done in the laboratory. And I'm going to talk about three studies very quickly. I'm going to tell you a little bit about radio tracking birds in Discovery Park. Uh, I'm going to describe a field experiment uh, getting at whether birds are really interested in singing interactions, as I've suggested they might be. And I'm going to talk about a field experiment which gets at uh, what are the good tutors and why are they uh, good. Uh, so I'm going to begin uh, by talking about the field work. This is Chris Templeton just finished uh, his dissertation, just got a, on a plane to Scotland on Monday where he's going to be doing a postdoc at St. Andrews, and he's the guy who led all the field studies on song learning that I'm going to talk about tonight. And behind him is Liz Campbell. You can barely see her, but there she is. And I'm going to take you to the field site. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, song learning in the field. There are field sites at Discovery Park. It's a very nice uh, field site because it is so close. And, and uh, what it means is that when we're teaching classes or taking classes, we can get out there and do research. Uh, and in fact, we'll go out tomorrow morning to do some research. Uh, so it's a wonderful kind of research to do, wonderful kind of field, field site where you can mix your teaching life with your uh, research life. Um, but it's kind of hard to study these guys in the field. Uh, it's pretty easy because you've got to find them in here, and these are little brown birds, and they forage on the ground, and if they don't want to be seen, they won't be seen. It's pretty easy to see the male. There he is singing, but you probably didn't even see this guy, did you? Okay, so that's the little guy, and you can see that potentially he could learn by simple eavesdropping just by sort of sneaking up and listening. We don't think that happens, and in fact, I'll talk about evidence that, that it doesn't happen in that way. Uh, but the way in which we actually are able to track them in the field uh, is to radio tag them. So you put these little radio transmitters on them, and it has a little antenna, which we call a jet pack. You see right there. Uh, here's Chris. Uh, he's just put a little teeny radio tag on them, weighs about 2% uh, of the bird's body weight and you have to change the batteries about six weeks later, so you have to catch them up again and change the battery, or if you're finished, you just simply take it off and, uh, and he's, he's done with it. Uh, and what this shows you here is a, a map of where we found two of the birds that we tracked uh, over 
We tracked a bird, uh, these birds in 2006, 2007, got out there every single day uh, to track them, and we then can plot where we find them. And this is just to give you a sense of it. And you can see two fairly different patterns here. Uh, Major and Moss, those names are their color bands. Uh, and uh, Major was kind of all over the place, and he had two different areas he liked. He liked it over here, he liked it over there. Uh, Moss was much more uh, confined uh, to his area. But even the guys that have more confined areas still get about, and they, they, uh, they, uh, they come near adult birds, uh, and in fact, quite a few of them. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. I'm just going to give you the key results from this uh, study. Uh, and the first is that all these birds, even the ones that went out small ways and those that traveled more widely, heard lots of different adults, and the range was 14 uh, to 30. Uh, so that's a lot of songs if you multiply each one of those by eight or nine songs. Uh, but most of the birds, uh, the birds, in fact, uh, learned only from a small number of these, usually about three or six of these guys, and then only from, you know, more from some of those tutors than others. And whenever I say tutor, I'm just referring to a bird whose song was learned. I'm not talking about what that bird intended to do. I'm just talking about the fact that he was a model for a song. Uh, the singers are usually far away from the young bird. So you find the young bird, you hear some singing, the guy's usually pretty far away who's singing. And in particular, they, we rarely saw direct interactions between the kids and the adults. We wanted to see them, we rarely saw them. They usually don't interact with them. Once in a while you see it, but not very often at all. Uh, so what this really means is that if in fact uh, they rarely interact with these adult birds, uh, then maybe they're using this social eavesdropping. Maybe that's a possibility. So this led to this field experiment that we did. And in this field experiment, we simply said, well, suppose we simulate two birds having a conversation as opposed to one bird singing by himself. Uh, will they find the interactive singing, or the counter singing as it's called, will they find that more interesting, and will they be attracted to it, and will they approach it, and will they listen to it, and presumably if they do this, then they might learn from it. Uh, and so we did this experiment, and so what we do is to go out there and find our bird with a radio tag, okay, we wander around till we find him, get him on the, on the receiver. Uh, there he is, with his little tag on him, pink, very nice. Uh, and then what we do is we set up our speakers. Now we're going to simulate an interaction, okay? We set up our speakers uh, 50 meters away from him. Uh, hopefully he doesn't move. If he moves, we run and we, we try to set them up in a new place. Uh, we have them about 10 meters apart. And then what we do is we play him uh, a conversation between two song sparrows. Um, now we need some, something to compare this with. And so the, what we do is we compare interactive singing when there's a conversation. In fact, the two birds are not only talking to each other, but they're type matching each other, which I just told you a little bit earlier is kind of a high level, intense, threatening kind of thing to do. So they hear that, or they hear a solo singing bird. And what we actually did was to have on one speaker a song sparrow and on another spe speaker a chickadee. So the chickadee is the controlled species, as, you, as it were. There are chickadees out there singing. Uh, and then for the final control condition, we just simply have two chickadees singing. Now, presumably, they won't care about the chickadees. So the prediction now is that they'll respond most to the interactive singing, uh, presumably intermediate to solo singing, and they won't care about the complete control condition at all. And here's what we actually find. Uh, and what this uh, shows you is the response, and this approach score just basically, um, uh, this approach score just basically takes into account how close they get, how quickly they move, and how long they stay there for the duration of the trial. And I think I can't remember how long we ran this actually, maybe about 10 minutes or so that this, that this goes on. Um, and what you see is that they approach the uh, control song um, much more than they do either the, uh, excuse me, the counter singing much more than they do the control song or the solo singing. And in fact, there's no statistical difference between the control and the solo singing. 
And therefore, it does seem clear that the, the, this, this counter singing is way more interesting than simply solo song, and solo song, in fact, is not particularly interesting. Okay, so that's that experiment. Uh, and the next, uh, now we basically, if in fact it's the case that direct interactions between adults and juveniles are rare, and if in fact um, juveniles are attracted to, to counter singing, then what this suggests is that this idea about social eavesdropping might be a better route to song learning than direct interaction in this particular case. Uh, and so we then said, okay, if that's the case, what sort of birds are they learning from? If the, if the young guy is, is, is basically not trying to interact with this, with this guy, but is in fact trying to learn, learn songs, what sort of uh, tutors are they going to interact with? And this shows you the difference between what a juvenile looks like and what an adult looks like. And also, we're interested now in the question, because we haven't really done this yet, we haven't really done this experiment yet, we're interested in how in fact these adults, these potential tutors, are going to respond to juvenile birds. Are they going to beat the crap out of them? Or are they going to teach them? What, what, what exactly are they going to do? Uh, and so we did this experiment. We compared good and bad tutors, and we asked whether the tutors that are good, that is to say tutors from whom kids learn lots of songs, are good tutors in that sense, are they more aggressive than bad tutors? And we had various reasons we thought that might be true, that might be true. And, uh, uh, and then we asked how aggressive are these adults, these potential tutors, uh, when they meet either another adult or a juvenile. Do they treat them the same? Do they treat them differently? Uh, so here's what we did. We simply took birds that had tutored songs in a previous year and said, okay, these guys were good and these guys were not so good. And when we did that, we took birds that were neighbors. So it wouldn't simply be that the kid had not visited that area. They're side-by-side -side guys. Uh, uh, one guy had tutored uh, a bunch of songs, another guy had not. So that's basically how we picked those guys. We then simulated an intrusion into the territory with a stuffed bird. I'll show you in a moment. And that stuffed bird, amazingly enough, sings. Um, so here we go. And then we did adult and juvenile intrusions, and we tested them three times the year. We tested them in the summer, which is the critical learning period, uh, and then also in the autumn and the early spring, when there can be some learning going on. Uh, and here we see, in fact, a uh, territorial song sparrow. That's him right here. He's doing a wing wave. Uh, and here is a stuffed bird sitting on his perch. And down below is a speaker that's actually playing song. Uh, and the, qu the question is, are the, are the good tutors, uh, are they going to be aggressive towards the mount? Uh, and how are they going to respond to uh, an adult mount versus a kid mount? That's an adult mount. That's the subject uh, who's uh, wing, wing waving. And here we see, uh, in fact, uh, another uh, uh, mount here. This is the juvenile mount right here. And here's the very mellow guy sitting there in the bushes. Uh, and I, or I gave it away just then, didn't I? But I just gave away the results. But anyway, okay. So adults uh, look like this. Juvies look like that. They look very different. However, they molt into adult plumage in September. So it's only in the, in the summer trials where they're going to look like juvies. However, they're going to sound like juvies uh, throughout. Okay, so that's a kid. Uh, and here he is in October, January. It's getting better now. And you can see some good stuff in here. See that trill's pretty nice, and those notes there are pretty nice. So he's getting better. That's plastic. That's sort of mid-plastic song. And these are crystallized songs. And he sounds like a song sparrow. Okay, so they go through this phase. Uh, the subsong phase is often referred to as sort of a bird babbling. Uh, plastic song is somewhere in between a uh, good crystallized song and this babbling. Okay, so here's the experiment. We test them in July. The adult looks like an adult. The juvenile looks like a juvenile. Uh, the song is appropriate to their age. By October, the juvenile now has adult plumage, but his song is still kind of crummy. It's early plastic song. And in January, which uh, if you live in Seattle, you know that's the first month of spring. Uh, <laughs> but for those of you elsewhere in the country, you should know 
this is really the first month of spring. So uh, they start doing their stuff then. So that's early spring. Uh, we put our, uh, our, our mount in the middle of the territory. I told you where the loudspeaker is. And we then play the song until the subject arrives uh, and for a minute after he arrives. And we keep the trial going for 20 minutes or until the bird is about to destroy the mount. <laughs> and then we rush in and we save the mount. Uh, we measure his aggressive response, which is how close he gets to the mount, how many flights he makes, number of soft songs, which is a special kind of threat signal, uh, number of wing waves, which I showed you is also a threat display. We don't, in fact, use the number of loud songs because loud songs in themselves really are, they are not, uh, they're not really aggressive. Uh, when the bird gets close to another bird and he's getting ready to rip his eyeballs out, then he no longer sings loud songs. He either shuts up or he sings just soft songs. Uh, now, the thing about attack, you might think attack would be a good measure, but in, in point of fact, the attack is a, there's a problem with attack, and that is they only actually attack uh, about 20% of the time. And that may be in part because this is a stuffed bird and he's just sitting there. <laughs> now, he may look pretty good, uh, but he's not behaving. So that may be why we don't get a higher percentage of attacks. When you see two uh, actual birds disputing a boundary and getting really close like this, they'll eventually start fighting uh, and roll around the ground. Um, uh, but I think that's why we don't get more attacks. So we don't actually use that measure, even where it might seem obvious. We take the first four things, we roll them into what's called a principal component analysis, which basically just uh, sums them up. Uh, okay, and now I'm going to show you uh, what it looks like, and I'm going to show you two videos. And the first one, uh, the bird uh, is just seeing the intruder, and you'll hear the intruder singing, uh, and he will do some soft song, which, which you may be able to hear, but uh, he won't do anything in this little clip. That's a soft song. The loud song is the mount, that's his song. That's a soft song from the uh, live bird. Okay, that's early in the trial. We're going to see the same bird a little bit later. Uh, and there's a little special thing I need to tell you about this. But here we go, same guy. Uh, and you can see this is what they do when they get fed up with the intruder. Um, they eventually attack him. Uh, the bird you saw here, the mountain you saw, may have looked a little bit scruffy. <laughs> Uh, and it's scruffy because, in fact, uh, we use this uh, bird for exactly this purpose, to get some uh, video footage. If this were a real uh, trial here, we would rush in and save the mount before it was ripped to pieces. Uh, and I think you get the picture. Uh, finally, uh, there's the response to juvenile. This is a juvenile mount here, and this is a different uh, bird, a uh, different subject. And you'll see he gives a very mellow and quiet response listens. And that song you hear is plastic song. Oh, excuse me, it's actually a sub song because this is a juvenile mount. This is a summertime trial. And our guy just looks him over and eventually he's actually going to lose interest and go away. But he does not try to interact in any way with this mount. That's good sub song you're hearing. Okay, uh, and this is the um, uh, result of this trial, uh, which basically shows you how aggressive the bird was on the vertical axis uh, as a function of how good of a tutor he was. And this is a tutor classification. I haven't talked about how we got the number, but basically that represents how much he has tutored in the past. And sure enough, and then what you really want to look at are these these lines, that's the best fit line. And what you see is that the birds that were better tutors are in fact more aggressive, but only to the blue, to the adult mount, which is the blue line, and they are not aggressive at all to the juvenile mount. This is in the summer, okay, during the critical period. Now what I'm gonna show you here is the same thing for all three seasons, so that's the one we just looked at. Uh, here's the autumn, and you can see if you just look at the lines, the best fit lines, 
you can see that that red line, the juvenile line, is now coming up to the adult line. And in fact, what that means is they're beginning to treat them sort of like adults or more like adults. And finally, you get to spring, and they basically treat the adults and the juveniles the same. Now, in the spring, the only difference is that one of these guys is giving you good adult song, and the other one is giving you kind of late plastic song. So you can definitely hear the difference, uh, but it's a much smaller difference than what you saw before. So basically, uh, if you summarize, to summarize these uh, findings, what we find is that the good tutors are, in fact, more aggressive or more interactive. I'm not, we're not quite sure what the word is here. I think there's definitely uh, a, a component of aggression here than the bad tutors. But they do this. This is true in the uh, summer only to other adults. They ignore the juveniles in the summer. But subsequently, they become more aggressive to the juvies. Uh, and by uh, spring, they're totally uh, aggressive to them. And what this suggests to us is that young birds may selectively learn from aggressive tutors, but they probably do it by eavesdropping on the adult song interactions. Uh, because basically the adults are going to simply ignore them in the summer. And what an interesting thing that, that we saw in a lot of these mount trials in the summer when we use the adult mount is that we're doing the experiment and the, and the subject is flying all around, and he's very upset about this bird who's on its territory, and he's doing soft song, and he's wing-waving, and he's thinking about attacking, presumably. Uh, and all of a sudden, you look, and you realize there's a kid sitting there. Uh, sometimes quite close, sometimes, you know, 10, 15 feet away, sometimes a little further. But this would happen a lot. So, you know, it's like the experiment, previous experiment I talked about. The kids somehow hear this going on. You know, they hear two birds singing. One of them's a stuffed bird, but you know, he doesn't know that. Uh, and uh, they hear this, and they show up, and they watch this thing very intently. And they often will sit there for five or ten minutes uh, while this is going on. Um, so uh, this is really consistent with the idea that maybe the best way to learn songs in this environment is, in fact, this social eavesdropping uh, uh, route. And to conclude, uh, there are basically uh, three things I would say to summarize these results. Uh, the first is that social interaction is obviously crucial uh, for vocal learning in songbirds, at least in this particular case, and actually probably in many cases. Uh, this is one of the first cases, I think, maybe the first case really studied in the field as well as the lab, uh, just like in humans. Uh, secondly, that social eavesdropping uh, may be at least as important as direct interaction, at least in birds like song sparrows, where in fact your tutors are going to be rivals. Uh, and I often like to say that perhaps this role in humans has been underestimated as well, and I think we learn a lot from simply listening to what's going on uh, around us. I'm always reminded at this point and have to tell the story of my sister, uh, my older sister, most articulate member of our family, did not say a word until she was two years old. But when she did, she spoke in complete sentences. Uh, so clearly, she'd been taking a ton in. And that's social eavesdropping, or at least probably a lot of that social eavesdropping. How do you learn that grammar otherwise? You can't learn that uh, by direct interaction. So I, th I, I, I am a hot on social eavesdropping as a phenomenon in human language learning as well as birds. Now, the question is why in these song sparrows uh, is social eavesdropping seem to play such a large role? And I think it may simply be because when you're learning from your rivals or your potential rivals and not from friends and family, this might just be the best way to do it. Um, and uh, in conclusion, let me thank uh, the folks that really have done most of the work that you see here. Uh, Chris, as I said, was in charge of, of all the field studies of song learning, uh, but also Liz Campbell, long-term uh, tech, uh, Chalar Akay, uh, who has got a whole separate line of research uh, uh, going on now, uh, John Burt, uh, and Cully Nordby, who did actually the original field studies that we, we did on song learning. And uh, finally, I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, National Science Foundation and Discovery Park has been very nice for 20-some years in letting us come out and do this crazy stuff out there. So thank you very much.
Can you hear me okay? Fascinating stuff. Uh, it's interest. I found it interesting that the juveniles didn't learn from all the adults, but they seemed, if I heard you correctly, right. attracted mostly to the aggressive males. But right. did they? Was there some perceived outcome from their aggression? Did they see some benefit from that, or is it just something innate? Uh, I, well, to answer the the I mean the question of why they learn from those particular males, of course, we would love to know. Uh, uh, one possibility is that these are the guys that are most likely to survive. And they start this learning in the summer, and then they, these guys are going to set up their territories, excuse me, the next spring. And uh, when they start learning, they don't necessarily know who their neighbors are going to be. And it probably would be a really good move if you want to be able to talk with your neighbors to learn the song to the guys who will be your neighbors. So if you learn from these guys that seem particularly vigorous, and are particularly formidable, maybe those are really good guys to learn from. So that's one possibility. But we, uh, there are a number of other theories you probably could come up with uh, that we, when we can't quite distinguish that particular theory from, from others. I have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> is, there, is there a potential advantage for the adult to impart its song on juveniles? Ah, <clears throat> really good question. Uh, one of the interesting uh, possibilities is the idea that the adults might, in fact, want to actually tutor. As I say, it might be some advantage to them to have other birds learn their songs, the new birds on the block learn their songs. In a number of species of, song uh, of, of songbirds, um, birds, in fact, continue to learn songs or modify their repertoires from year to year. They never do as much as they do in the first year, but they will modify the reps. And what they often do is to modify the repertoires to match new birds that have come in. Well, if you stop learning in your first year, there's an alternative to doing that, and that is to teach the newcomers your songs. So that's actually a really interesting possibility. We have absolutely no evidence for it, but it's a great, great theory uh, that, they, that they might actually be, maybe the word tutor is not is not so inappropriate here. It might be quite appropriate. Okay, we'll thank Professor Beecher again. Good.